shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's today's prophecy update. Vladimir Putin's sudden withdrawal of Russian troops from Syria has left many wondering what his strategy is. The Bible clearly prophesies that Russia will participate in the UN invasion of Israel during the Battle of Armageddon. Why then the withdrawal? Putin replied to his critics by announcing Russia would maintain a naval base and an air force base in Syria. He claims Russia could be back into Syria in full force within a few hours. There's the secret. Russia has temporarily pulled out most of its troops from Syria. But just like the prophecies foretell, the Russian bear will be back at the appointed time. Well, we've got a wonderful program for you today before I dive into it. Uh, let me remind you that we're in the middle of the greatest sale ever here at End Time Ministries. Uh, this is a time of the year when many people want to do things. It's springtime. And so we decided we were going to offer some things to you just on sale. The, the greatest sale ever. If you'd like to investigate, maybe you've been wanting to get some things from End Time Ministries. You've been sort of looking for a bargain. Uh, so jump on the internet. Go to endtime.com. And there you can shop. You can see everything that's offered. It's right there on our homepage. You can see everything. So greatest sale ever. And this will help End Time Ministries to stay on the air and to continue our work to preach the gospel to every single creature. We appreciate all that you do. Thank you so very much. Well, just in a few hours here in the United States, it's already begun over in Europe and also in Israel. The Feast of Purim will begin. Uh, Purim is a very special holiday to the Jewish people. And I want to tell you the story of Purim today because if you don't know the story, it means nothing to you, but it's one of the most important holidays in all Jewish observances. Here's the story. You remember when Jeremiah prophesied to Judah that they had to go into captivity to Nebuchadnezzar. If they went willingly, they would be blessed in their captivity. If they resisted, they would be destroyed. Well, Daniel, the three Hebrew children, along with Mordecai and his cousin Esther, went freely down into Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon. Now, Mordecai and Esther ended up in Shushan, Today it's called Susa in Iran, but it was Shushan back in those days. It was, it was part of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Of course, Persia today is called Iran, but it's the exact same thing. Nevertheless, they went down, Mordecai and his cousin Esther went down. Now the reason that they were traveling together is because Esther's parents had died. Even though she was his cousin, he was older and he was able to take care of Esther. So they went down together into the captivity. Well, as time went on, a very interesting thing developed in Shushan. Uh, one day, King Hazuerus was throwing a huge feast. As a matter of fact, it was a 180 day feast, it was a big shindig. And toward the end of the feast, he was drunken upon wine. Now his queen, his wife, Vashti, had also thrown a feast for the women. So everybody was partying. But King Ahasuerus had a little bit too much to drink, apparently. And in his merriment, he decided he wanted everyone to see how beautiful a woman he was married to. So he commanded that Vashti come before all of his friends so that they could view her beauty. 
Well, Vashti was a little rebellious. She didn't like the idea very much, so she refused to come. And after sitting for her twice, now then, Ahasuerus doesn't know what to do. Plus, the men of his realm gathered around and said, King, if you allow your wife to get by with this, none of us are going to be able to live with our wives because you know how leadership works. If our wives find out that Vashti can rebel against you and not obey you, then we're going to have big trouble. So King Ahasuerus said, well, what do you think I should do? They said, you've got to put her away and send throughout all the land of your kingdom for beautiful young virgins to replace Vashti as the queen of the realm. So that's what Ahasuerus did. Well, when the word of this came out, Mordecai was living there very near the palace in Shushan, and he just felt like he should have Esther, because she was very beautiful, apply to become the queen. So Esther volunteered, and this was quite a ritual. She went through 12 months of purification. The first six months, they did thir- certain things to make her skin beautiful. The next six months, they did other things. But here was something really interesting about Esther. The Bible says that she was under the care of the king's chamberlain, and she required nothing except what the king's chamberlain advised her to have. I'm sure all the girls that came in, they all had their taste. Some of them may have had tattoos. Some of them may have had all kinds of jewelry, everything you can imagine. But when the chamberlain said, Esther, what would you like to have? You're going to go before the king. She said, you tell me. You know the king. You know what he likes. And she required nothing except what the king liked and what the king's chamberlain advised her to have. Well, when Esther went in before the king, that was all there, that was all there was to it. The king absolutely fell in love with Esther. He said the selection process is over and Esther became the new queen. Now, it may interest you to know that the name Esther is also the name Hadassah. As a matter of fact, that, that name is also mentioned in the book of Esther in the Bible. Now, why do I mention that? Because the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem today is the most famous hospital in the Middle East. It's sort of the Mayo Clinic of the Middle East. So Esther is a very highly revealed person in the history of the nation of Israel. I'm going to tell you why. Well, what happened was, Esther is now the queen. Mordecai is still down there just living as normal. He was sort of in the king's gate. Uh, However, as time went along, uh, something happened that things started to go sour for Mordecai. Now, Mordecai told Esther, don't tell anybody that you're a, a Jewish person because the Jews historically have come under a lot of persecution. He just thought it would be wiser if she kept that bit of her history to herself. Well, there was a man who began to rise in the realm of Ahasuerus. His name was Haman. And Haman was really favored by Ahasuerus. And he's growing very rapidly, even to the point that when he walked out of the palace every evening, everybody fell to their knees and bowed to Haman. Well, everybody except for one. Mordecai was Jewish. And of course, Jews are instructed, you don't bow down to anybody, you don't worship anyone except the one true God. The very cornerstone of all their belief system is, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and him only shalt thou serve. You should never pray to more than one God. You should never Worship more than one God. There is one true and living God, and that's all that you should ever worship. To worship any other is to be an idolater. Okay. Well, Haman was just being adored by everyone except for Mordecai. Well, that spoiled the whole party for Haman. He went home and he told his wife and all his family, Oh, I'm being exalted by the king. I'm being brought up to second place in the kingdom. It's amazing. The favor that I'm enjoying. And then he said, but 
there's one guy that spoils the whole thing for me. There's this man by the name of Mordecai. He's a Jew. And supposedly his laws will not allow him to bow. And he's just, he gets under my skin so bad that every day I go home, I'm in a horrible mood. Well, his wife said to him, well, Haman, you don't have to put up with that. I mean, after all, you've got the ear of the king. Just go to the king and let's make a plan. And furthermore, build a, a gallows and build it 50 cubits high. That's about 75 feet high. I'm talking about a gallows to hang someone on. 75 feet up in the air. So Haman liked the idea and he went before the king the next day. They were building the gallows and he went before the king the next day and said, oh king, there are people in your realm that don't obey your laws. There are different people. And there are people that will cause us trouble. We, I think we should make war against them and eradicate them if at all possible. And by that time, Ahasuerus was so trusting with Haman that he said, well, listen, whatever you like to do, you go right ahead and do it. I'm behind you. And he gave the, Haman his, his ring that had the seal that made things the official law of the Medes and the Persians. So the law was passed that on the 12th month, on the 13th day of the 12th month, it was going to be open season on the Jewish people. And these billboards were published throughout the entire realm. Now, Ahasuerus ruled over 127 provinces all the way from India in the north to Ethiopia in the south. His domain was huge. He was very, very powerful. So the word went out. Well, Mordecai read the bulletins that were on all the posts of the city. And he realized that there was evil determined against him and his people. Consequently, he put on, on sackcloth and ashes and he was at the king's gate. Now you couldn't go into the king's gate if you had sackcloth on. He didn't want to see anybody that was mourning or sorrowful. That would make him unhappy. Therefore, there was a law. You can't go in there. So he didn't go in, but he stayed outside. Well, somehow the, the person that was the servant to Esther took word to Esther and said, Hey, your cousin Mordecai is outside the gate in sackcloth and ashes. So she sent word back and said, Ask him why. So Mordecai told her uh, that uh, there was evil determined against her people. And she said, well, I can't do anything about it. He said, listen, you've got to go talk to the king. She said, I haven't been called. And there's the law of the Medes and the Persians that says, if you go in before the king, not having been called, you're to immediately be put to death, no matter who you are. Only except if he is pleased with your entrance he will for, hold forth the golden scepter showing that he favors you. Well, Mordecai replied back to Esther and said, look, don't think just because you're in the palace, you will escape the decree because this decree is the decree of the Medes and the Persians. It's unchangeable, unalterable once the law is passed. It'll get you too. And furthermore, Esther, now remember, he was Esther's guardian. He had become her father because all of her parents were dying. And so he was the caretaker and he had taught her what she knew. And then he said to her, and Esther, who knows, but the, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I don't think it's an accident that your queen, a little Jewish girl, would come down part of the captives from Judah ended up being the queen of one of the greatest powers on earth? Who knows, but God put you there just for this moment. There's destiny on you, Esther. She sent back and said, gather all the Jews together, have them fast and pray. Don't eat a bite, don't drink a, a bite day and night for the next three days. And I will go before the king. And then she said these famous words. And if I perish, I perish. Well, they did that. They fasted, they prayed. Esther and all of her maidens fasted and prayed. And on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes, her most beautiful garments. 
Then she stepped up to the door of the courtyard of the king and slipped inside. Well, that was not a usual occurrence because anybody that did that, they were risking their lives. It was almost certain death. Immediately, of course, it caught King Ahasuerus' attention. And he looked and there he saw beautiful Esther, the girl he had fallen in love with. And immediately he extended the golden scepter and said, come to me, Esther, whatever you want, I will give it to you to the half of the kingdom. Now remember, Haman was plotting and he was already building the gallows that they were going to hang Mordecai on, hopefully the next day. Well, here's what happened. When the king asked Esther, what do you want? She said, I'd like for you and your right-hand man, Haman, to come to a banquet that I am preparing for you. He said, you've got it. Send out the word to Haman, you're to be there. Well, now Haman, he gets the word that only the king and himself are being invited to a dinner put on by Queen Esther. He's so excited at this additional honor. He was drunk on honor anyway. So he was so excited by this additional honor that he went home bragging to his wife and family and he said also tomorrow morning I'm going to go in and ask the king to allow me to to hang Mordecai. So early the next morning Haman goes in and he's out in the courtyard waiting to go in to see the king but the night before the king had had a dream. A matter of fact, he couldn't sleep. So he got up, he was walking the floor and he called for the chronicles to be brought to him to read the history of some things that had happened in his kingdom. Well, previous to this, two men had plotted to kill Ahasuerus. Mordecai had overheard them and he went to the authorities and told them and they captured these two men and the life of Ahasuerus was spared. Well, this was in the chronicles that just happened to be read to the king because he couldn't sleep. So what's going on here? So he reads, the king hears about this and he says, what's been done to this man who saved my life? And they said, nothing, your honor. He says, well, that's wrong. We've got to do something special. He says, who's out there in the courtyard? Oh, it's Haman. Tell him to come in. Haman walks in. Now he was there to ask to hang Mordecai on his 75 feet high gallows. But instead the king says to him, Haman, what should I do to a person that I highly delight in? How could I pay this person proper honor? And Haman immediately was so conceited, he thought it can't be anybody else but me. And so he said, well, take the king's clothing, the robes, and the king's crown and put it on him and take the king's chariot and the king's horses and put that man in that chariot and pull him through the city and then put one of your highest princes to run before him and say, thus shall be done to the man in whom the king delighteth. Well, Ahasuerus thought that was a great idea. So he said to Haman, go get Mordecai. Put my robe upon him. Do exactly to him and you run before him. All of a sudden, all of Haman's plans are turning sour on him. He realizes that the very person that he planned to hang was now becoming the king's favorite. Things were not going well. So he's very disillusioned After doing this, he goes home, tells his wife what happens. His advisors say, oh my, you might as well put a black hood on your head. You're getting ready to be killed. He's going to do away with you. You have fallen into disfavor. But he had an appointment. He had to be there with the king for the dinner that was being prepared by Esther that evening. So they go to the dinner. And the king said to Esther, okay, now I've come to your dinner What is it that you want? And she said, oh, king, there is a person in your realm that seeks the hurt of me and my people. 
he would put us to death. And the king was so angry. He said, who in the world is this person? And Esther pointed to Haman and said, it's this evil Haman. And the king was so angry. He jumped up and ran out into the garden to try to cool off. Well, Esther was reclining on the bed. And so Haman runs over and jumps on the bed and grabs her by the feet and says, oh, please, please, please spare my life. And then the king comes back and he misunderstands what Haman's trying to do. He thinks that Haman's there trying to force his wife. And he says, oh, so you're not only going to do what you've already done, but now you're going to try to force my wife. And immediately they came, they put a cover over his face, and they took Haman out. The king gave the order that Haman was to be hung on his own gallows. But there was still a problem. The problem was that the order of the Medes and the Persians was unalterable. Once it had the king's stamp, it could not be reversed even by the king himself. That's the way their law worked. So now then, something had to be done. Well, first of all, Ahasuerus gave the order to take everything Haman had and gift it to Mordecai. And then he brought Mordecai in to be his trusted advisor rather than Haman. In the meantime, though, Mordecai's got to figure out a way because the order had been given that all the Jewish people on the 13th of Adar were to be persecuted and killed. Everybody could take vengeance upon them. And there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the land because Haman had seen to it that there was. So how do we get this reversed? Well, they couldn't reverse the law, but they could pass another law stating that the Jews would be allowed to defend themselves and to take vengeance upon their enemies on those very same days. So now then Mordecai has the king's seal. He brings the scribes. They write out the law. The lawyers go through all the wording to make sure it fits all the law of the Medes and the Persians. And they pass this law and they send the notice out to the land. And now the Jews are rejoicing because they have the legal right to defend themselves. Well, the time of Adar the 13th rolled around. And the Jews began to fight against their enemies and they did it the extension the order was even extended till the next day and they killed 75,000 of their enemies and now all of a sudden the Jews were in such favor that a lot of the people that lived the Iranians the, uh, the Babylonians the Medes the Persians they wanted to become Jewish because now it was the end thing to be Jewish and now the Jewish people realized that God had delivered them from their enemies now this, there's an interesting scripture with this. In Esther chapter 9, verse 20, it says, And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both near and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly. So Mordecai passes this decree that there should be an annual feast, a celebration of the great deliverance that God had wrought upon the Persians that were enemies to the Jews. They established a feast called Purnum. The word Pur means lot because Haman had cast lots to determine the date. So they decided to name the feast Purim and every year in Israel. And by the way, the date is starting evening tonight. That is in Israel, the 14th day of Adar. It's starting tonight and they will be celebrating in the streets of Jerusalem the next day or two. They will be dressing up in costumes. They will be attending the synagogues and they actually have these noisemakers. And as the story of Haman is told, every time his name comes up, they're going to rattle these noisemakers so no one can hear his name to blot out the name of Haman. But this incredible story, 
Jeremiah preached and said, if you go willingly down into captivity, I will bless you in your captivity. And here Esther ends up being the queen. Mordecai ends up being second ruler in the entire kingdom. God avenges his, the Jewish people upon their enemies. Daniel becomes third ruler in the kingdom. The three Hebrew children become high up, all because they obey God. I want to say to all of you out there, when you put God first in your life, it all works out. Do you know there's a scripture in the Bible that says all things work together for good to them that love God, which are the called according to his purpose? Do you know when you're born again and you totally commit yourself to Jesus Christ, the Bible says that all things will begin working for your good. Everything that's happening to you right now is for your good. Think about this. Well, we're going to be taking your calls in the latter part of the program. Right now, though, let me talk to you. Here at End Time Ministries, uh, there is a special need right now. Uh, we need to stay on the air in all of our venues, our television, our radio. It's never been more important than right now. Uh, so we have some needs. And uh, one time I had to cancel some stations. And a lot of people said to me, look, don't ever let that happen again. If you're going to have to cancel, tell us. We'll help you. Well, I'm telling you right now, we do need some special help. If you're out there and God's blessed you, where you can make a special gift to End Time Ministries right now, we do need some help at this time. Now listen, you've been wonderful, and if you can't do it, I understand. You can still pray for us. We're going to be okay by faith, but we do need your help. So if you're out there and you're listening today and you'd like to be a blessing at this time, I'd just ask, invite you to make a special donation today to End Time Ministries. To do that, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. Uh, whatever it is, no gift is too large or small. It will help us out tremendously. One more time, the number 1-800-END-TIME. If you prefer to do it online, go to endtime.com. Click the donate button. When current events are found in Bible prophecy, it's astonishing. At End Time Ministries, we are seeing them unfold every day, and so can you. We've put together a current events and Bible prophecy package for anyone who wants to understand like never before. Irvin Baxter and his dedicated staff have spent hundreds of hours of research and study, and in doing so have discovered that current events and Bible prophecy are telling the same story. These 13 DVDs will prepare you to be ready in this extraordinary time that God has destined you to live. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com and save over 20% when you buy the current events in Bible Prophecy Package. All my life, I have heard the statement, nobody's perfect. But one day, Hebrews 10, 14 caught my attention. It says, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I attempted to reconcile this statement with what I had viewed as the many imperfections in myself. Could it be that there are human beings on this earth that God considers perfect? In You Are Perfect, Urban Baxter explains what it means to be sanctified and why God sees those that are sanctified as perfect. This teaching has given people peace and security in their walk with God because of new understanding of how God sees them. This lesson is available on DVD, CD, in printed format, or even digital download to tell you not what's wrong with you, but what's right with you. You are perfect. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com to get yours today. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to continue to listen to today's broadcast. We are taking your calls in this half of the program. The number to be on the air with me, 877-END-TIME to reach our operators. That number is 1-800-END-TIME. I noticed they were talking during the break about our DVD, You Are Perfect. I'll never forget the day I was in my living room reading my Bible. I was in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. And I read, He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. All I had heard my whole life was, nobody's perfect. I looked at that scripture and thought, wait, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified? I don't feel like I'm perfect. Maybe I'm not sanctified. 
And so I looked up what sanctification means. The Bible says we're sanctified by his blood. Well, I knew I had the blood of Christ on my life. Well, that set me off on a thousand hours of study that resulted in the DVD, You Are Perfect. If you are biblically born again, you are perfect in the eyes of God. And once you understand that, then it will totally deliver you from all condemnation. God doesn't want you under condemnation. The Bible says there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If you have a guilt problem, I urge you, get the You Are Perfect DVD. It may be the best thing you ever got in your entire life. Okay, I do want to get to the phones now. Let's go first of all to Dan calling from Florida. Dan, thank you for holding. Uh, Brother Baxter? Yes, Dan. Uh, good. Uh, how are you doing? I am doing wonderful. Thank you. Good. Um, I have a question about the four blood moons. There is, there is a YouTube video, uh, an Australian guy talks about the four blood moons, and he said that after the, during, during the four blood moons of 1948 was when David Ben-Gurion became pre uh, premier of Israel, and, uh, it ha and the last blood moon happened 333 days after the um, the three, 333 days before the last blood moon. Wait, I'm sorry, Pastor. Uh, let me say that again. David Ben Gurion became Israeli Prime Minister 30, 333 days after, or, or before the last blood moon. Am I confusing you at all? Well, I'm following you closely. Go ahead and put it out there, Dan, and I'll try to make some sense of it. Okay. Um, and he also said, this, uh, that um, 333 days after the blood moon in this tetrad, which would be August 28th of this year, I believe, would be when they start building the third temple. Okay, well, Dan, let me tell you this. We put out a DVD on the four blood moons. You know, there were so many things being taught about it. Um, you know, a lot of people were saying that the rapture would happen. Uh, some were saying that the world would change forever. But now the four blood moons that happened in 2014, 2015, they're past. And as of right now, nothing happened. So a lot of people are now trying to adjust what they did say to figure out something else they can say about the four blood moons. Bottom line is this. The blood moons are not a biblical prophecy. All of the teaching, I understand that. All of the teaching about the four blood moons is not in the Bible. Now there is one teaching in the Bible about the moon turning to blood and the Bible specifically says when that's going to happen. It's going to happen immediately after the tribulation. The Bible says, after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light. That also is the same time as the sixth seal. The Bible says the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's the only blood moon prophesied in the Bible. All these other things taught. Now, they were an interesting coincidence because... Uh, in the last 500 years, there had been now four sets of four blood moons. Uh, and the first, uh, the first set of four blood moons was in, in uh, 1493 and 94. Well, in 1492, the Spanish Inquisition was declared. And then the next set of four blood moons was 1949, 1950. In 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn. And then the next set of blood moons was 1967, 68. That's when the nation of Israel conquered the West Bank and came back into their promised land. And so the blood moons that happened in 14, 2014, 2015, people thought a major event would happen again. Well, they came and went, and it didn't happen. So a lot of people are disappointed. I just want to make sure that everyone understands that it did look like that there were some really neat coincidences that were within a year or so of the four blood moons that occurred in 1493, 1949, 1967. There were some really interesting things that happened in close proximity to those four blood moons. 
But to teach that as a scriptural prophecy, in my opinion, was, uh, was a little reckless. And we put out the four blood moons, and I said this. I observed the coincidences, but I said, this is not a biblical prophecy. Here's what the Bible says about the four blood moons, and about the blood moons. It doesn't say anything about the four blood moons, but it does say that the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So that's my understanding, Dan, and I'm not trying to trace anyone. I'm just simply saying that that to me is what the biblical perspective about the blood moon. Okay. Now, I don't know how that fits into your question, uh, but that is, that is my study, and I spent hours and hours and hours on it because there were people, there were well-known prophecy teachers saying that something is going to change the world forever during the four blood moons. Well, that didn't, that didn't happen. And so now then, they've either gone totally silent or else they're looking for an alternative theory that will still fit. And that's the thing I don't think we should do. I think if it's a biblical prophecy, you can, you can build the world on it, and it'll always come to pass. But it's, if it's a man-made idea, you, we have to be careful before we embrace it. Okay. Thank you, Brother Baxter. Okay. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate the call very much. And I uh, certainly don't want to be unkind to anybody, but nevertheless, that's my understanding. Let's get right back to the phones now. And Sandy is calling from New York. Hello, Sandy. Sandy, are you with me? Okay, uh, one more time. Uh, Sandy, are you there? Okay, I don't know whether we've lost Sandy or not. If so, Sandy, please call us back. Uh, we do have open lines today. The number to call if you'd like to be on the air with me, is 877-END-TIME, 877-363-8463. I suppose one reason that Purim is such a revered holiday for the Jewish people is because they've come under such horrible persecution over the last 2,000 years. I mean, we're only 60-some years removed from Hitler's horrible Holocaust. Why wouldn't the Jewish people rejoice at a holiday that commemorates their deliverance. And God's been good to the Jewish people in spite of some of the negative things that indeed have happened. And you know, when we show thanksgiving, a lot of times that will ensure that things don't happen again. When God sees that we're thankful when we have experienced deliverance, then he notices that and he sends a blessing upon us uh, and also may, may ensure that it does not happen again. Now, let me tell you, the anti-Semitism against the Jewish people is still out there. I would say to every Christian, if you're inclined to be a Christian and you're anti-Semitic, you are in a very unscriptural position because the Bible says, if you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. If we misuse the Jewish people, or any child of God, then we will misuse Jesus Christ himself. So I'm just simply saying that don't let anyone tell you, well, the Jews are the one that causes all the war on earth. The Jews are trying to rule the world. There's a lot of people trying to rule the world. The Masons want to rule the world. The Muslims want to rule the world. And many others, I'm not even going to name them all because some of you would get mad at me. But there are a lot of people out there. The term New World Order ha is being used right now by people who dream of establishing a New World Order, a One World Government. So there's a lot of that going on right now. But be very careful. You know, they just recently took the ban off of selling Mein Kampf in Germany. Mein Kampf, of course, is the book written by Adolf Hitler that fueled the horrible Holocaust against the Jewish people. I just want to say, if you're a Christian, you can't hate anybody. I mean, there's no room for hate in our heart. Okay, uh, well, i tell you what. Let's get back to the phones now. I see Sandy's back with us, so I'm going to go there right now. Sandy from New York. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Irvin. Yes. Well, God bless you. I'm so glad to talk to you today um, on the, well, the eve of Purim. I was so, just so th uh, thankful. You told the story so beautifully, and it was such a delight to hear it uh, from you. 
<laughs> I mean, it was the first time I heard it today, and we're going to hear it tonight and tomorrow, but it was just delightful, and I just want to thank you so very much and wish you a wonderful, happy Purim. Uh, I am Jewish, and I'm, I'm suffering persecution here in New York City, crazy kind of stuff, but uh, it's a wonderful holiday, and this is a great holy week, uh, holy season, and I'm just uh, very happy to call and talk to you. Also, I just want to mention that I, I got a, an email from a person, uh, and it had a picture of what the um, Temple Mount would look like if it was uh, divided. I wanted to send it to to you, and um, uh, I just guess I, I sent it on the email uh, to endtimes.com. Yeah, endtime at endtime.com and okay. put, it to, put it to my attention. Oh, okay, I will. And, and thank you so much for being there. I'm praying for you when you uh, do your travels and just... Okay, well, I, ver well, I, I well, definitely well, will. Well, Sandy, before I let you go, uh, yeah. I'll be flying out to Israel tomorrow, actually. And okay. And we're going to be there for the next 12 days. And then we're coming back through Europe to observe the Holy Roman Empire there because people really need to understand what's going on in our world. And you know the Jewish people have a slogan, uh, never again. Uh, I know. Oh, especially yeah. referring to uh, Hitler's horrible Holocaust. And That's they right. rejoice in the fact that they now have their own nation with their own army, with their own military power so that they can defend themselves. And you know... For the nation of Israel, the nation is never again going to march off like lambs to gas chambers. However, I do want to tell the Jewish people that there is persecution coming to the Jews again outside of Israel, oh, in yeah. particular in Europe. Uh, the Antichrist is coming. According to the prophecies of the Bible, he will come out of Europe. And I'm holding two conferences in Europe over the next few weeks, one in London and one in Paris. And I'm going to be telling them that there's another Holocaust coming and that all the Jewish people of Europe should get out and either get to the United States or get to Israel because another wave of, per of persecution is coming. It says it very clearly in Daniel chapter 12. It talks about three and a half years before Armageddon. It says, and then shall Michael, the prince of your people, stand up for then will be a time of trouble such as never been before never nor was. ever again shall be. Never shall be. Yeah, and so I want to tell all the Jewish people because we don't want it to affect any one of you. And to everyone who will listen to the prophecies, they will escape. But then there's going to be some that won't listen and they're going to have some trouble. So we're going to do everything we can to help all of them to escape. I'm up against a, a break here, Sandy. i got to let you go. But thank you so much for calling. Appreciate the call very much. The seeds of the Battle of Armageddon were sown on November 29, 2012. The seeds sown on that historic day are in the process of producing a dreadful harvest. The Bible actually describes it as the harvest of Armageddon. Learn the story of what happened on November 29, 2012, when the seeds were sown for the world's final battle, the growth of which are the events that will occur on the journey to where the story ends at the reaping of the harvest of Armageddon. Call 1-800-END-TIME to order this important lesson. I want to introduce you today to what I call the Armageddon Hospital. It was October of 2010. The headline, Israel Builds World's Largest Underground Hospital, immediately arrested my attention. When I read that it was being built in Haifa, Israel, I fully understood the implications of this announcement. Haifa is located at the western end of the plain of Megiddo, the prophesied site of the Battle of Armageddon. Would the world's largest underground hospital, specifically designed for use in time of war, actually become the hospital to which the wounded of the Battle of Armageddon would be brought? It was obvious to me that the answer to this question was undoubtedly yes. Go to endtime.com and under Irvin's Thoughts, click the Rombaum link to watch the video.
I want to get right back to the phones. We have several callers waiting. I want to move quickly because I want to get all of you in. Uh, let's now go to Angela calling from Louisiana. Hello, Angela. Angela, are you with me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I hear you well. Thank you. What's on your mind? Um, well, I had a question. If our next president ends up being one that um, pulls us out of this one world um, union government, whatever it is that um, we're trying to be totally sucked into, and then he builds up our military and everything, will this also include a mandatory draft of our young men? Um, I just wanted your thoughts on that, please, sir. And I really love listening to you, appreciate you. And one more thing, my husband got to go to Israel with you about 10 years ago with his father, and they just had the most wonderful trip. And I I hope one day that I'll be able to um, come along. But I'm going to hang up and take it offline and love and appreciate you. Okay, well, thank you, Angela. By the way, our next trip will be in the fall in October, October 27 through November the 7th. It'll be a 12-day tour, Israel only. It's going to be a marvelous time to go, so start planning right now. We'd love to have you, Angela, and anybody else out there. You can actually call today about that particular tour. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. Now, as far as uh, what the prophecies say, here's what the prophecies say about the U.S. and its future. We are going to remain a friend to Israel. We are apparently not going to be a part of the one world government of the Antichrist. As a matter of fact, we're going to defend Israel against the one world government. We're also going to protect Jordan against the one world government. So we're apparently going to be on the outside. Now, whether the military buildup that's being spoken of right now by some of the presidential candidates, whether that would involve a renewal of the draft or not, I don't know. Uh, as long as they can get volunteers, they probably won't have to. They only would do that if uh, they could not get the adequate manpower by way of a volunteer. So I don't know the answer to that uh, as to whether it will mean that there will be a draft or not. Uh, I will tell all of you out there, please be very prayerful about uh, the presidential elections. I want the person that God wants. So it's going to be very important. Uh, that all of us feel that way. Even if the one God wants is not my pick, I still want the one God wants because we need God's will to be done in earth as it is in heaven right now more than ever before. Okay, let's get right back to the phones. Jim is calling from Indiana. Hello, Jim. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. Okay, I heard that... Uh there was a comment by the president that he was going to use NATO to give half of Jerusalem to Palestine and half of Jerusalem to Israel. Have you heard anything about that? No, I haven't. However, I have heard this. He is flirting with supporting a UN resolution that would uh, determine the way a peace deal should look between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, France actually introduced this resolution a week ago Monday uh, to the European Union and John Kerry was present when it was introduced and he appeared to give his approval. And the word is out of Washington that since negotiations have not worked between Palestinians and Israelis, the time perhaps has come for the international community to make its best determination about what a peace should really look like and to propose it and, and to pass a UN resolution which would make it internationally binding upon Israel. So uh, it looks like that that might happen. We don't know yet. There's going to be a deal some way, whether it's by negotiation or whether it's going to be done through a UN mandate with pressure from the world community. I cannot tell you right now how it's going to happen, but it looks like President Obama has made up in his mind he's going to try one more time in the few months that he has left to finally close the loop and bring peace to the Middle East. It would be the very greatest thing in his legacy as president. So uh, it looks like they're going to try it again. We're going to find out within the next couple of months. Yeah, lots of pressure there. Thank you much. Uh, well, there is a tremendous amount of pressure. And again, it's the same thing. Uh, in the end, all the nations are going to gather against Jerusalem. The Bible actually says that. Uh, the Bible says that all of uh, all nations. It's in Zechariah chapter 14 too. It says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem 
to battle. Now that's only describing one thing. That's describing a UN army representing all the nations of the world and they will come down to invade Israel to force Israel to do what Israel does not want to do. And they will actually fight against Israel. Israel will resist the world government armies and Israel will be in the process of losing that war even to the point that half of Jerusalem will fall to the world government forces and when that happens, Almighty God's going to be watching all, all the proceedings and that's when he's going to leave the portals of heaven, going to come down, put his feet on the Mount of Olives. The Bible says he will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So already what you're saying, when you have, see the United Nations contemplating action against Israel, that is simply a precursor to what the Bible specifically says that the United Nations will invade Israel. Of course, the first thing that happens when there's an, a resolution, if people don't comply, then they, uh, they put it under economic sanctions. They try economic pressure first. If that doesn't work, the next step is military invasion. Well, that's apparently the path that we're already flirting with going down right now. However, the military invasion has to be at least seven years away. The Bible explicitly foretells that there's going to be a seven-year uh, period after the peace process is actually signed. There will be seven years until the actual Battle of Armageddon. So we live in amazing territory. Of course, one of the things that all of us need to realize is there's another huge prophecy besides that one. And that's a prophecy. There's a war coming out of the Euphrates River area that's going to kill one third of mankind. And of course, all of you have been noticing the horrible terrorist attacks on Brussels, Belgium, a day before yesterday. And here's what Defense Minister of Israel, Moshe Yalan, said. Uh, he's, on Tuesday, he said, uh, the lethal Islamic State bombings in Brussels earlier in the day that left 34 murdered and warned that World War III is looming. And so we have many voices around the world warning of World War III. Well, there's going to be World War III. It's called the Euphrates River War in the Bible or the Sixth Trumpet War. If you want to read about it, you can go to Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 16. It explicitly says there that a war will emanate from the Euphrates River and it will ultimately engulf the world, resulting in the killing of one-third of the human race. Now, I'm not telling you this might happen. I am telling you that you can write it in stone right now. It is going to happen. The Bible says that the prophecies never fail. I wish it were not going to happen because it's going to be the worst war the world has ever known. Now, let me tell you this. I believe the Lord has brought an enlightenment to my mind over the last few weeks. We've always seen end time prophecy as frightening, as something to be avoided, as something that we should dread and fear. But recently it's like God said, wait a minute, you're looking at this whole thing wrong. Don't you understand that I have engineered end time prophecy to give you the greatest revival the world has ever known. Now you think about it. We already know what's coming. We know there's a war coming that's going to kill one third of mankind. We're already talking about it. I already had a full page ad in the USA Today a few years ago warning that this was coming. We put it out all over the world. DVDs we put out. Well, when it happens, people are going to say, oh my goodness, that's in the Bible. Well, then the Bible says that there's going to be a peace deal in Israel. That's going to happen. And that's going to get people's attention. And we're going to announce at that time to the whole world that the final seven years to Armageddon just began. Well, then the Bible teaches that during the first three and a half years of that final seven years, there's going to be a temple built on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount's going to be placed under a sharing arrangement so that both, both Muslims and Jews can worship there. On the Jewish portion of the Temple Mount, a Jewish temple is going to be built. 
and Jews will go there to worship, including offering animal sacrifices there, just like they did in the Old Testament, because if you don't believe your Messiah has come yet, you're still under the law, therefore you should still fulfill the rituals of the law, and they're going to for a short period of time. What I'm telling you is all these prophecies, as they come to pass, we're going to be telling the world before it ever happens, this is going to happen, then that's going to happen. We'll draw you a chart. We can tell you everything that's going to happen, basically, between now and the Battle of Armageddon. Well, when we're able to do that, what a tremendous evangelism tool that's going to be. The Bible says, I tell you these things before they happen, so that when they do come to pass, you might believe. So as Christians, we should not fear prophetic fulfillment. It's all ordained of God. And that's whose side we're on. And God ordained all these prophecies to feed the fire of the last great end time revival. The Bible says there's going to be great end time revival. Read it for yourself. Revelation 7, verse 9 through 14. John said, I saw a great multitude that no man could number out of every kindred, out of every tongue, out of every nation. And a voice said to John, what are these? And he said, well, I don't know. What are they? And the voice replied, these are they that have come out of great tribulation." And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I'm telling you, during the great tribulation, there's going to be a great multitude out of every kindred, out of every tongue, out of every nation. And it's going to be the result of all these prophecies being fulfilled. Now, some people will reject and refuse to believe even when they see it right in front of their face. Well, there's nothing we can do about that. They did that at the first coming of Jesus. But to the ones who have an honest heart and who love the truth, they're going to see it, they're going to embrace it, and the Bible prophesies a great revival. So educate yourself on the prophecies. If you do not have a working knowledge of Bible prophecy, and I mean where you really know that you understand it, we put together a 14 DVD series, and it explains the prophecies, the main ones you need to understand uh, in 14 one-hour lessons. When you go through these lessons, you get through them, you'll know more about Bible prophecy than 95% of the graduates from theological seminary, I promise you. And you can have these for yourself right now. They're available today. And oh, by the way, don't tell anybody, but they're on sale. We're in the middle of the biggest sale end times ever had. If you're interested... Pick up the phone and call us. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. And don't forget, the ministry here is in need of some special support right now. If God's blessed you where you can make a special donation right now, it would help us so greatly. So do what you can. Pray about it. And I know the Lord's going to richly bless you. The number to call to do that, 1-800-END-TIME. If you prefer to do it online, go to endtime.com. End of the Age is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.